Welcome to the Top M&A Entrepreneurs Podcast. We have a guest today. His name is Shannon Scott. Uh, Shannon's a lifelong resident of Alabama. Uh, he's That's great. Done, uh, he's done M&A work, bought uh, a company for 800K in revenue and built it to 20 million and sold it. He's uh, worked in, uh, built and sold 15 companies, startups over the last 20 years. Uh, welcome to the show, Shannon. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. So let's start about your journey. Now, have you always been an entrepreneur? Or did you work for somebody oh, goodness, time and just say, that's not me? Uh, I started my first company when I was 19 years old. So I guess you could say I've pretty much always been an entrepreneur. I think my previous job from my uh, first business was I was a busboy at a, at a barbecue restaurant. You know, it's really big down here in Alabama in the South. So, yeah, I've uh, been an entrepreneur ever since then. Yeah. And uh, let's talk about the, well, the show is called Top M&A Entrepreneurs, but let's talk about that acquisition you did. Now, have you, how many have you done over your career? So I've, I've started 15 total companies, but I've acquired nine. Um, nine. And that's in the last 15, 15 years. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about that first one. What was that? First company was an IT consulting company. We did, now this was back in the day before, um, you know, DSL and cable internet. This was back in the ISDN days. Yeah. Uh, where we were securing networks with hardware and not software. Um, so we were, we were going into hospitals and major uh, medical practices and securing it with uh, hardware called AdTran. At the time, it was a Cisco competitor, but we were one of the few groups in the Southeast that could do that. So I had gone out and actually hired a bunch of AdTran uh, technicians to come work for us. We actually lived in a small townhouse, townhouse together, gave them all equity in the company. So they were already servicing a lot of those accounts. So Came over, worked for us, all became partners in the business and turned around and sold it to a uh, competitor when I was 23. Wow. How, how was the exit? I mean, what did you grow the revenue to? And uh... <clears throat> we, were, uh, we were just short of about 12 million on the exit. Wow. That's lovely. I mean, is it, uh, what did you feel at that time? Should I do this again? Or was you, were you happy with this life changing event? Oh, uh, well, you know, I think like back then, most entrepreneurs wanted to do, um, I decided I was going to take a little time off and try to be a professional poker player in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. moved out there for a while. Um, quickly realized probably after three or four months that I, uh, this is not the life for me. I need to be back in business. I need to be owning a business. So, and I started a few other consulting firms, um, learned a lot of lessons from that first business um, for sure. I uh, probably sold it too early, should have held on to it a couple more years, but I've always had that itch to continue to grow, acquire and start businesses. I, I don't think I'll ever get rid of that. I'll probably work to the day I die for sure. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I will too. I'm 60 and I'll probably work till the day I die. Yeah, I love doing this. So <laughs> what was it? You said you learned a couple of lessons for that acquisition. One was to you sold too early. Do you think you could have grown it to 50 million or 100 million in revenue or what? Well, I think I, I, I think I could have. I definitely feel like we could have at least got to the 20 million mark within the next 24 months. Um, you know, 23 years old, somebody waves a 12 million dollar check in front of you and you're, you know, you're, it's hard to turn that down. Um, you know, I probably sold it for cheaper than I could have sold it as well. You know, these are all life lessons. Um, but, you know, the company was it was a great learning lesson for me. And, you know, I don't ever look back. You've got to continue to look forward. Um, that that revenue from you know that profit from that sell that company allowed me to acquire three or four more other companies within the next four or five years. Um, so no disappointment there, but definitely life lessons learned for sure. Yeah. Well, what was the multiple on the exit there? Was it? I mean, it was a one. It was a one times multiple. It was a service based business, you know, a contract service based business. So. You know, a lot of that, especially back then, I mean, those contracts were a dime a dozen, you know, they were going with the cheapest hourly rate, you know, not necessarily a lot of those technicians back then couldn't be certified except on a few small things. You know, there's so many certifications nowadays for all the equipment out there, all the tech software certifications. Um, <clears throat> so it was a service based business and the company did grow it. They grew our book of business to probably 30 million in revenue and then they did an exit. Um, I don't know exactly what multiple they got, but yeah, was that uh, one X of sales? <clears throat> One exit sales, correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's how CPAs, accountants, sold for too, service-based businesses. So you use the money on acquiring a number of other businesses. What same industry or what uh, industry do you go to into? A little bit different. 
different industries. I mean, we did have a company that did some internet development work programming. So we went more from the hardware side to the software side of things. We built some large intranets at one point. <clears throat> we built an internet for Mercedes, um, which is, you know, they had just moved to Alabama manufacturing, you know, their a couple of their vehicles down here. So um, a lot of, but a lot of more secure internet internal, you know, what you would consider now would it be like a SharePoint. <laughs> we were back in the day trying to build those SharePoint applications. Um, it, it became, it kind of grew into a, a marketing company as well. You know, we started developing websites, started developing some markup materials, doing video creations. Uh, so it kind of created a, a spun off on a life of its own. Um, that company, we actually rolled up into another local company as well. Um, I did not hold on to that company as, as long simply because I had another opportunity come across uh, for an investment that was a highly grow, high growth company. They wanted me to be CEO. So I kind of jumped from sold that to my business partner and jumped to this new, this new entity. Yeah. What uh, did you have to invest in it or they just wanted you to take over it? I did. Um, they were looking for capital. And uh, this was in 2007. I had owned a couple of small companies in between that pro that time. But 2007, they were looking for about a million dollars in capital. Um, and we were, you know, I had obviously just come off selling that that other organization. But this was a this was a company very similar to a company I'm CEO of right now. Um, we basically did business incentive consulting. And the CEO had, had approached me <clears throat> with my IT background and said, uh, you know, we'd like to talk to you about a possible investment in the company. We're trying to raise a little capital right now. A small company. They were, goodness, seven, seven employees at the time, about doing about 800 a year in capital or in revenue, excuse me, 800,000. Um, went in there. I looked at the process. It was a very paper oriented pro process that they were doing and they were trying to service companies nationwide. And this is back when people were still using facts, right? So people were faxing information extremely insecure. Uh, so went in, I said, listen, this is a, this is a great organization. The business model is amazing, but this definitely needs a tech play. You know, we need to turn this into kind of a software as a service, um, instead of a, you know, a service business and a paper-based business. So we did, we spent the next two years growing it as a software as a service. Back then that term was not very popular, right? It was software as service companies were not very, you know, high end in 2009. So we were one of the first to, to, in my book, to consider, uh, launching a company of that nature. So. How did you make the decision that the the growth of this company that was all paper, but nationwide was a lot better opportunity than the other one? Well, so this company has, it was unique. Um, there was very few companies at the time doing this. I mean, you could find a digital marketing and programming company on almost every corner, um, you know, back during that day. This company had three competitors in the country at the time. Two of them were Fortune 500 companies. <laughs> So we kind of were able to sneak in and, and disrupt the market tremendously. You know, these companies, these larger companies were not nimble. They weren't developing technology. They were doing surveys over the phone, doing surveys over fax. You know, we're releasing mobile apps at the time, you know, on the, on the original iPhone. We're releasing, um, you know, SaaS-based software, a lot better security, a lot better screening. So we were able to pick off a tremendous amount of their clients, even their fortune clients, because of the fact of A, lack of security, but B, this was a segment and not a core product of these businesses. So they weren't paying a lot of attention to it. It was, it was acquisitions that they had made previously. They weren't growing that side of the organization and allowed us to pick off a lot of clients. Yeah. How did you, you brought a million dollars into that? I mean, what did that buy you as far as a slice of the equity? And did you just say I'm in charge also? Kind of the uh, well, <laughs> I think it was it was kind of a mutual decision. So um, at the time, it was a very executive heavy organization. I would say probably 80 percent of the salaries were going out to what you would consider stockholders, or original investors of the company um, and just not a lot of work getting done and a lot of things being accomplished. So the CEO at the time was probably enjoying the fact that I would come in and be the bad guy a little bit, you know, put some pressure on the executive team. And, uh, and tell them they're going to perform or they're going to be out, um, especially because I was bringing you know, some financing to the organization. So I came on as president initially, stayed as president for a year, took over the CEO role, um, ended up doing an MBO, management buyout, you know, fairly shortly after that to get the stockholders out of the organization, especially the underperforming stockholders. Um, and when I say underperforming, some had other businesses, you know, some just weren't able to contribute to the business and some just you know, obviously didn't want to contribute. Um, so went ahead and did a clean slate on the MBO, you know, kind of started from scratch, bought, bought the whole board out, including the original founder um, and, the, and the original CEO at the time. 
Yeah. And what did that buy you as far as the slice of equity? 50% or more? <clears throat> Uh, the original the original investment bought me twenty percent. Um, the MBO uh, was a full buyout. Yeah. Oh, so one hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And what did you take that to with your? So we we took it to um, just short of it. Goodness, when I when I bought it, it was about three million in revenue. We took it to about ten million in revenue really quickly. Yeah. We, we were an eight five hundred award winner three years in a row. Um, and then when we hit about that $10 million re revenue mark, we got approached by an organization that just was offering us way, you know, three times revenue, <laughs> um, at that time, which was just unheard of for that business. So we obviously jumped at the chance to, uh, to get acquired, uh, from that company as well. Yeah. We're going to find money like that out there. Yeah. Well, what, yeah, today it's kind of, it might even been higher, but what was your feeling about that? You just look. You went to the rest of the board, or you went to you hundred percent buyout. We're never going to get three X again. Or was there any kind of? I'm trying to find out like why people sell. I have a mentor that says, "Hey, it's be it's great to own it. It's better to sell it." <laughs> <laughs> well, so at the time, um, the, the nature of the business is um, really the revenue potential is a um, tax credit organization. So. What we're doing is we're consulting companies throughout the country on business incentives that are available based on the federal government and Congress passing laws. Um, at the time that we sold, the climate in Congress was not friendly to business incentives. In fact, there were a lot of bills that were up there uh, to pass. They they didn't pass, but it was a very high it was a very high risk uh, initiative because you know in these businesses they're high profit but they're also high risk. So the Congress at any point can say, you know what, we're just not going to give research and development credits anymore. We're going to take that away. You know, yeah. uh, we're not going to give business incentives for hiring people on welfare, food stamp benefits. It's called the work opportunity tax credit program. Um, these are things that Congress passes and they've been passing for 20 years, but there was a lot of talk in Congress at the time, you know, that we're going to probably cut back on a lot of these business incentive programs because, you know, the, the culture and a lot of the talk up there was, hey, businesses aren't paying enough taxes, especially these Fortune 500 companies. They're not paying their fair share in taxes. So there was a big groundswell for that. And some of those bills did get um, passed, uh, not the major ones, but you know, it was a risk reward situation. Yes, we could have held on to it and, and grown the organization bigger. But at that time, for what they were valuing the company at, um, and they really wanted the client list, to be honest with you, they were rolling end up into a bigger organization that did multiple things was able to kind of diversify the service offering um but you know that risk was probably for the rest of the board not worth taking considering the temperament in congress at that time yeah was it uh 3x it was all cash oh uh, yeah it, well, it was not all cash there was some stock in the deal for a couple of the executives and a couple of board members some of the other board members did not want to you know hang on and just get they wanted full cash for their stock yeah that's impressive. I mean, and then what did you do after that? Um, I, you know, took a couple, honestly, well, I said I was going to take a couple of years off, but as the story goes from the first time we talked about, you're a tried ginger. to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried to do that. I actually bought a couple of, um, you know, invested in a couple of franchises, um, you know, during that two year time that I was kind of working through what, what my next step is going to be. Um, did some venture capital for some small startups here in Birmingham. Um, and, and currently, you know, I'm sitting on the board of some of them as well. Um, and then came back out and launched a business after that two year kind of non compete situation was over and started a business it's similar to it, the business I sold recently. I'm not exactly like it. We're taking more of a, of a software, a heavy software approach and more of a more of a kind of a white label and reseller approach for CPA firms. So it's a different business model, but kind of same industry. Um, but during that two years, I was just, you know, investing in businesses, um, seeing where I wanted to be, figure it out. But I've got a passion for this industry. And once you have a passion for something, man, it's hard to let go of. Yeah. And those uh, franchises, what kind of franchises did you buy there? So I bought a franchise. I actually bought a staffing company. Um, you know, staffing has been a hot business for many, many years. Uh, Climate right now is probably not the greatest, but this was pre-pandemic. And, uh, you know, these staffing companies, they do sell for impressive multiples, um, you know, if you hit a certain revenue number. Um, I also bought a pet care company. It's very similar to like an Uber where uh, the, or a WAG, you've probably heard of WAG, right? Um, no, oh, yeah, yeah. WAG was uh, SoftBank, wasn't it? 
Yeah, yeah. So um, this was a this is a franchise that you know comes to your house and you you hire sitters very much like Uber drivers and they take care of your animals. That way you're not having to board them. Um, and, and then I also bought a promotions company. Um, so we we do a lot of promotional materials for trade shows and things like that. Yeah. What was your grand plan? Because that's a diverse set of businesses. <laughs> <laughs> it was to diversify. It was to diversify 100%. Um, you know, yeah, it, we we knew, um, me and my original partner um, in, the, in the larger company that sold, we knew we were going to put something back together again. Um, I've also invested, I mean, just, you know, I've got a small investment in a distillery. <laughs> we'll be one of the only bourbons distilled in the state of Alabama here this year. Um, so that's a path passion thing uh, for me. Um, I'm a big uh, bourbon guy, bourbon connoisseur. So that's more of a passion thing. But he and I, and he and I are in that business together. We knew we were going to put something big together. But in that in that period, these businesses, especially the franchise, they're kind of self-sustaining, self-running businesses, right? They're a business in a box. I mean, you have to work the business and you have to, uh, you know, it's, it's quite an investment in some of these businesses. But I've got strong managers running the businesses for me, diversifying that portfolio a little bit. And Quite frankly, the first couple of years, it wasn't a terrible tax write off because, you know, you're going to take some losses in your first couple of years of buying a franchise, right? Your, yeah. your return on investments, you're probably looking five to seven years on most franchise businesses for return on investment. So, you know, that helped from a capital gains perspective a little bit as well. Yeah. How did you, uh, are you good at selecting managers and just identifying great people to put in those roles? You know, I would say I've learned a lot over the years. I would say um, there's not a method or a secret formula that I use. I do like high energy um, people that have experience outside of that industry that can bring a fresh perspective to the industry. It's okay to have some similarities, but you know, you've got somebody who's been sitting in the industry for 20 years. They're going to do what they've done every single day. They're not going to bring fresh perspective or fresh ideas. But I think more importantly, it's about empowering the people. It's not been making them understand it's okay to make mistakes. You know, I don't want you at my doorstep every day asking, uh, you know, for permission. I want you to ask for forgiveness um, and let them be empowered and let them learn, but set expectations. Make sure they understand the KPIs when they first start that position. This is what I expect of you. These are the revenue targets that we're going to hit. And here's the consequences if we don't hit them. And I guess the most important thing is bringing these managers in is giving them equity. Um, I truly believe that employees should earn equity in every situation, especially from a management level. Um, they've got to have skin in the game, um, especially in this climate right now, this employment climate. I mean, I, you understand it's, it's uh, impossible to keep people, but it's even more impossible to hire them. Um, so you're seeing more and more companies having to do that. That's something that we've done from the beginning. I mean, and, and most of my businesses that have sold, there's been either an equity payout to the employees or there's been a cash benefit or cash incentive for them upon the sale yeah. of the company. Do when you go recruit somebody, are they looking for equity in a business like that's part of the pitch or is it higher distributions? Um, it, it, it kind of varies. You know, I've had some employees that have flat out come in here and said, hey, look, you know, the only way I'm going to make this transition is with equity. Um, but what I've seen, you know, more attractive to people nowadays is just this profit sharing. Um, you know, it, it, equity scares people sometimes, especially people who've never owned equity in organizations and especially in a startup situation, right? Equity to them means, uh-oh, if something goes wrong, I'm on the hook for this stuff as well. That's not necessarily the case, right? Especially depends on how you structure the corporation, right? But it does, it does sometimes kind of throw people off, especially who don't understand, have never owned equity, have never been in stocks before. So, you know, profit sharing is it's much simpler to explain. Hey, look, we make X, you're going to get Y. Yeah. So what, what are the consequences if somebody doesn't hit their numbers, let's say the first quarter, second quarter, what does that look like? Well, I mean, obviously we're going to, you know, I'm not a person who pulls the trigger. I believe in mentorship. I believe everybody should have an opportunity to learn and grow personal growth and business growth. But I mean, there would be, you know, expectations. So we, in, in a first startup, I kind of give a six month period. I say, look, here's the first things I'm going to expect to you in six months. One is to learn the business. Two is learn what the competitors do. I think the competitor SWAT is one thing every single business should do. The first thing they should do outside of hiring a couple of good people is understand your competitors, understand the market, get some time and give them time to breathe and, and look at that. Um, and then at that point, you know, if they're not continuing to make the, meet the KPIs, then I mean, they've, you know, unfortunately, you, you're in the business to make money. Um, you know, I'll, I use this kind of motto everywhere. Um, everything's personal. Uh, yeah, you know, I can't stand it when I get on, you know, read these books and these self-help books and these business books. Oh, don't take it personally. It's just business. That's not true. Everything in life is personal. And, and I don't mean it from, you know, a necessarily competitive standpoint, 
But if you're going to be in a business and you're going to own stock in a business and you lose a deal to your competitor, that's money out of your children's pocket. That's money out of your children's college, college education. Take it personally. Don't have to get mad about it. Don't have to pout about it, but take it personally. Because when you start taking things personal, then it becomes a different scenario to you every single time you approach a deal, every single time you approach a client, or even when you make a customer service call, take it personally. Um, and, so, and, and that's the kind of people I want. I want people who will take these things personally. A loss is a loss. You learn from losses, you move on from losses, but you don't want to repeat that. Are you training people for that? Or are you trying to identify that characteristic? How they, I mean, is there a kind of a test that you put through people through to find passion like that? There's not, uh, there's not a test. I mean, there are, you know, I have used services before where they've given, you know, um, psychological Fires, assessment breaks, testing, stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but to me, it's about the passion and the competitiveness. Um, you know, I, I like to have ex athletes, um, you know, they're very competitive people by nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of my most, one of my most successful, um, managers has been who was a former uh, you know miss mississippi uh, a beauty queen <laughs> she's very competitive by nature um so it, it to me it's about the competitive heart and the competitive spirit um you can learn almost anything if you have the desire and the will to do it you can learn almost anything some of the businesses i've been in, in my life like that first business i was telling you about that only had three competitors that one i invested in 2007 it's there was no business like it out there. I couldn't go hire experienced people, right? Because you can't hire experienced people from a business that you're creating. Right. Um, so it's got to be about something else. It's got to be deeper than that. It's got to be the willingness to learn. And this new company that I have today, 95% of my employees have never been in this industry before. But they're learning, they're training. We have a corporate trainer on staff and our corporate trainer's job is to train them on a daily basis. Anytime there's something new, you're, we're out there training. We're doing lunch and learns. We're continuing to, to self-educate our, our employees on a, on a monthly basis. That's on incentive. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. How big is that now? Uh, our first year, we hit $25 million in revenue. $25 million in the first year. And that was a startup? or a, a... Yeah, it's a, it was a startup. Wow. Um, we're on track uh, Wait, already. How, how, you got to explain how you did that. How, how did you do that? Yeah, get to $25 million. Uh, it was a combination of experience in this industry, um, a combination of learning how to streamline a sales process and a partnership process where we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So we rely on a lot of partners to bring us business. We don't have a huge internal sales staff. Um, we do referral, referral partner relationships, strategic partner relationships. We partner with software companies. So we had a network of people there that we've used previously. We went back to we got some help from Congress, and quite frankly, we got some help from COVID unintentionally. Um, but there was some bills passed in Congress to help small businesses with, you know, COVID recovery. And part of what we do, our consulting, is is part of business recovery and business incentives, right? So it kind of hit perfectly at the same time. Um, but we've been able to do this with a very skeleton staff. We have less than twenty five people on staff at, at the at the moment, which you know is tremendous. But we're on track to do fifty million this year in revenue. And right now we're looking at two acquisitions uh, of companies in the next two months that will you know, enhance that even more. Yeah. And this is the uh, R&D tax credits and. Uh, R&D tax credits, work opportunity tax credits, um, disaster incentives. You know, if, if your business is affected by floods or hurricanes or fires, there's all kinds of government incentives that come behind. Um, they're trying to encourage businesses to, re to retain employment. You know, your first natural reaction is any CEO when something bad happens is let's get rid of our most, you know, our biggest expense, which is always labor. Um, these government programs are trying to incentivize businesses to say, hold on, stop, take a breath. Don't fire everybody. We know there's something bad happened. We're going to come in with some incentives um, and sometimes they're cash for funds. Sometimes they're incentives on future taxes. But just just take a step back. Take a deep breath. We're here to help. Um, and, and that's got to be a learned behavior, right? So the government continues to try to do these things after a disaster or, you know, a pandemic. Is, uh, is that most of your business now is from the uh, disasters or a, the reason I bring this up is because I ran across a guy that owned a IT company and started another company called Strike Tax, which is R&D tax credits. And he said that's taken off and he's gotten all kinds of uh, publicity uh, attention towards that. He thinks that's a billion dollar opportunity. Yeah, I mean, it could be. There's an R and D is one of the things we do. So something similar. We do some some different types of credits as well, like the work opportunity tax credits, a new hire credit. 
So if you hire people based on certain demographics, um, for example, veterans, if you hire veterans, there's, there's federal money for doing that. If you hire felons, people on welfare, food stamps, unemployment, that's a huge opportunity. I mean, unemployment is what, you know, one of the biggest categories in the country right now. What is there, 40% of, of all able-bodied American workers on some type of government benefit right now? Um, so as you hire them back off of unemployment, there's, there's, there's business incentives there available to you. R&D is and one of the things about R&D that's so appealing right now is that it was made permanent, um, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, it used to be a bill that was kind of fluctuating back and forth or whether they would renew it. But the permanency of it, I think, makes it very attractive. It's a lot of work. Um, it's, it's difficult to have mass quantity of clients when you're doing a lot of paperwork. So, and I'm sure this individual that, you know, is probably developing some kind of software component to it. Yeah. That's what we did as well. Yeah. Let's go back to, I want to go back to your business model. So you relied on other channels, kind of like an affiliate network or a distribution network to get the message out about your product. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so we could, you know, the the we could hire, go hire 100 salespeople. I mean, if you're in a payroll company, you know, if you're working for an ADP or you're managing an ADP, their success is based on sales reps. Um, they put a bunch of sales reps on the street. There's a lot of high turnover, a lot of training. Our model is a little bit different because of the speed we had to get to uh, to revenue, the speed I wanted to get to revenue to take advantage of some of these incentives that do expire. I could go hire a sales force of 100 people. That takes time. It takes training. It takes effort. Or I could bring in a core group of people that I trust that I know can learn quickly and rely on partners to give us leads. I mean, we're going to pay $7 million in commissions out just based on last year. Um, you know, for a group of 50 or 60 business owners and a couple of, you know, independent sales agents, that's a lot of money. Um, yeah. We've got a... We've got a retired uh, HR consultant in Mississippi that we're going to give $800,000 commission check to this year. She's been retired for 17 years, I believe. Turn it over a That's lead. a pretty good payday. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great payday. So you had, let me go back to that. You have 25 employees, right? So it's your, something like that? Yes, 25. Yeah. And doing about a million per employee, it sounds like. That's correct. Yeah. And, and most of those employees are our service and software technicians. Um, so we only have five full-time sales reps. Wow. Uh, what's your plan for exit on this one? I, are, are you courting private equity funds to say, hey, this is what we're doing to kind of build up the excitement around this? Or are you waiting for somebody else to go, ah, oh, we got to buy this company? So, you know, I've always kind of raised my businesses off of two different philosophies. One is we can build a business or two is we can build a business to disrupt a market. Um, these types of businesses that, that I'm in right now are definitely disruption businesses. What I mean by that is we're going to go after the big boys that are playing. We're going to go after the fortune companies. We're going to go take a percentage of their market share. Um, this is not a business I'm looking to exit in the next one or two years. I do have some acquisitions I'm making right now, some strategic acquisitions. Um, for tech and for client base as well. So, you know, one is a, one is an IP purchase. One is going to be a stock purchase. Um, but it is to buy market share, but also to increase awareness. These are going to be big splashes. A um, uh, lot of headline, a lot of press is going to be a couple of these businesses are very unique businesses that complement. They're not the same business that we are, but they complement the services that we offer. Um, and then we'll look at, you know, equity at some point, some private equity at some point, maybe you no know, mid next year. But right now with our revenue and the track of our revenue and profitability that we're, we're making right now, there's really no need for capital. I mean, if we do, yeah. I can put the capital in myself, but right. you know, $25 million a year with 25 employees, you can understand in Birmingham, Alabama, our over, overhead is not killing us by any stretch of the imagination. And if we hit 50 million this year, I mean, we'll, you know, we're at a 60 to 65% margin. So you're on toward target towards 50 million after just two months, or is that a different uh, calorie year? So by the end of this calendar year, um, our target's 50 million based on based on our growth patterns and based on the clients we've already signed up. Yeah. And how are, um, what about the employees here? Do they own stock in the company equity? And uh, We do have a, we do have a group that do own equity and everybody else does get profit share. Yeah. So um, everybody in the organization is either getting a profit share or does have a, a, a small percentage of equity in the organization. Yeah. When you go back to that, those two acquisitions you're making, you said that one was IP and one was stock. What, what do you mean stock and products of 
inventory or stock? No, I'm sorry. It was going to be a stock purchase. So we're buying the whole company. We're not just buying the IP asset. So, you know, essentially being the IP, one would be an asset and one would be a stock purchase. So um, the intellectual property of one of the companies we're looking to buy is very complimentary to and, and preventing us from having to build some software right now, to be honest with you, um, would probably take us you know, 12 to 18 months to build. Uh, the other is, you know, it's a it's an extensive client base. Um, it's a perfect fit for our client base and for our core product offering. So our goal is to buy that company and approach that client base that they currently have with our service and product. Yeah, offerings. that's beautiful. Are they profitable companies? Both, Both of one is uh, break even and the other one is profitable. And you could immediately, just like the person that bought or the company that bought your company for 3X, plug it in and probably pay for itself really fast. Uh, we, we will, uh, at minimum, triple their revenue in year one. At minimum. That's 2023 20, or as soon as you acquire yep. it? Yeah. Yep. And how is that purchase? Uh, is it your cash out of pocket? Are you trying to finance it? LBO? What? Uh, it's, it's going to be a stock and cash, um, 85% cash and the rest in stock. Yeah. Yeah. That's lovely. I mean, we're going to see you on, I know you were already on the 8,500, weren't you? Yeah. Well, we were, we were back in 2007, eight, nine. Oh yeah. We'll definitely be this year. I'm, I mean, out of a, you know, we went from the company actually initially launched in 2020 and November of 2020. So very little revenue. And, you know, Inc. 500 is based on year over year revenue growth. So 4,000 to 5,000 percent. Yeah. Yeah. From going to a couple hundred thousand dollars to 25 million in year one is probably going to have us. That's I would imagine you probably at the top. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably somewhere up there. So what is this? I got to go to back about, you know, who Shannon is like, what motivates you to keep doing this and, you know, keep seeing these opportunities and just going back to the well and says, I got to do this. I got to do it. I feel it. Well, I think what motivates me, and this is probably a pretty cliche to answer is I, I have a group of children that are very entrepreneur spirits themselves. Um, my 13 year old daughter runs a sugar scrub business already at, on Etsy. What business? At, what? A sugar scrub business. It's like a skincare business on Etsy. Oh. Um, you know, her first day in business, I think she sold like, $1,200 of merchandise her first day in business at 13. Wait, how so did she do that? I mean, you got to get attention to it. What did she do? She oh, yeah. Did, well, I mean, she she made some creative videos and um, we spent oh we God. spent some ad dollars and, you know, she's 13 years old and she's, she's determined or she's, when we first sat down and talked about this business, she said that, you know, I want to give a percentage of my profits back to children with, with cancer. And of course, she, you know, that messaging is part of it. She lives up to that. I mean, we, we do the same thing every day here. So you're aware of percentage, 1% of all of our profits go to veterans, job programs in our company, and then the other percent of profits. Uh, so we have 2% of profits going out. The other percent goes to disaster recovery um, programs, local disaster recovery, not a national Red Cross, but as if a hurricane hits Houston, Texas, we're going to find a local charity and a percent of those profits will go yeah. um, to that as well. So we believe in giving back to the community and, and, and doing business with integrity, but you know, I'm teaching my kids to do the same thing. And there's, they've seen this grow over the years. And I also have adopted two kids as well. Um, they are, boy, they're entrepreneurs. They're asking me every day. They want to come work here every single day. So I think that's, <laughs> that's part great. of the motivation yeah. uh, to keep going. But the other part of the motivation is, you know, I, I look at some famous, uh, some famous football coaches in history, and also look at my own grandfather, to be honest with you. Well, you've got a couple um, in Alabama. I just can't think of them. Oh. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, there was a coach. There was a coach. Um, and it's so funny. My, my, my grandfather, before he passed away, told me this. There was a coach, you know, somebody might know him. I think his name is Paul Bear Bryant or something. Yeah. Um, there was a <laughs> – there was an interview. The new coach, everybody because, goes, Paul who? <laughs> right, exactly, right. Uh, I think he's kind of taken over a little bit, uh, especially for the younger crowd. I, my, my kids don't know who Paul Bear Bryan is, but I remember watching an interview when I was a kid with his wife, and they somebody asked him, the local reporter said, or asked her, what's going to happen to him when he retires? Because he's been in football his whole life. And she said, well, he'll probably pass away. He won't have anything to do. He'd be bored to death in, in a tongue in cheek manner. Like he, he probably, um, I believe if I recall correctly, I think Paul Bear Bryan after like eight or nine months of officially retiring died. 
Um, you know, I think there's, and, and my grandfather was the same. My grandfather worked, my grandfather passed away at 98 years old. He died uh, or, uh, he worked until he was 97. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he set an example for me and, and I'm not saying that everybody should do that. You shouldn't enjoy life. Don't get me wrong. But I think there's something about waking up every morning and have something to do and have something to accomplish and that brain activity that keeps you going. And I want something to accomplish every single day. I would be bored. I'm just not a guy who wants to sit with a fishing pole. I know a lot of people enjoy that. I'm just not that guy. I want to be in an office doing a webinar, doing a Zoom meeting. That's the kind of thing that, that motivates me. Yeah, I tell you, you uh, follow Charlie Munger. I mean, both of those guys. Charlie's 98 years old and still loves doing what he's doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm, I'm hoping to, and I would probably tell you that, you know, uh, <laughs> my significant other would probably not want me working that late and I probably won't go to 98, but I'm, but I'm always going to be doing something, um, you yeah. know, so it, I, I, it's just, it's just go, go ahead. I, I want to go back to your kid there that uh, $1,200 you touched on a thing that's really people are doing today. Cause Snoop Dogg does it. Uh, Ryan Reynolds does it. Uh, uh, the rock does it. They productize their audience. They build an audience and then they sell to that audience that they do. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. And she does. I mean, she understands the audience and quite frankly, the majority of people buying the product from her are moms. They're seeing are, that. They're so a 13 year old is selling to moms. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a female product. It's a body product, but, and she's home making it, but I think they see her on that video and, you know, she's appealing to them and she, I mean, my daughter understands the market. I mean, these mother have children too, you know, and they want to support another child who, you know, they want their child to grow up and maybe start a sugar scrub business. So we actually see that demographic and you can see a little bit about who's purchasing those products. And, you know, I mean, parents to support parents, parents support kids and my goodness those videos my daughter does they she's going straight to their heart 100 percent straight to their heart who, who helped so. her write the script because the, the content is one of the most important things to get people motivated having a great offer i would say um you know i obviously help her polish the script um you know i have some people around me obviously marketing teams and stuff that have helped you know polish the script as well but she went around to some of my neighbors or females and said, hey, well, first of all, here's some samples of the product. So tell me if you would buy it, but also tell me what you think about it and what you feel about it and what it makes you feel like when you use just it. Ask. Yeah, yeah just beautiful. ask. Yeah. And she got the feedback she needs. And so she she kind of you know created the content or she gave me an idea of what she wanted the content to look like. And we you know, obviously helped and, and ran with it. I mean, obviously, she's not creating videos on her own. We're getting a little assistance there, but she's actually showing videos of how she makes the product. So they're seeing exactly step-by-step step of, of how, what goes into that product. So yeah, that's, I, was, that's, I was impressed. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, what if she comes to you and say, Hey, I don't want to go to college. You cool with that? <laughs> I, I'm totally cool with that. I, I am, I am going to encourage my children to do whatever they want to do. I've got you know, I've got a child who's probably going to end up in a, you know, an Ivy League school who's who's also a, a tremendous soccer player. And uh, he can pretty much go wherever he wants to. And he wants to be an accountant. He doesn't necessarily want to be an entrepreneur. He wants to be a CPA or something. Um, Working knock, for knock his sister. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, maybe one day he'll come work for me and be one of my CPAs. But, you know, what? It's about their dreams. Uh, I got to live my dreams. I want to encourage them to live their dreams. And if it if it's, you know, doing a sugar scrub business or it's becoming a hairstylist and opening a salon or something, you know, that's their passion. And, and I want them to do what they're passionate yeah. about. So how are you as a dad, do you tell them to outline what they should do or do they wait for them to come ask a question and you answer it? Oh no, I definitely wait. I definitely wait. I, I'm, I'm not outlining anything for them. I'm encouraging them to be creative and come up with things and they're seeing it. Now, you know, one of the things I think I would regret if somebody asked me what my, one of my biggest regrets was, is, you know, raising companies like this is raising children and you're on the road a lot. You're working a lot of hours. And, you know, I probably missed some things that I regret missing in my children's life. But I think they're seeing that now and they're seeing that work pay off and they're seeing some of the advantages they get out of that. And what probably was hurt at the time has become more understanding, but I think it drives passion, too. Um, sometimes you got to miss the soccer game for a meeting, right? And it's terrible. And, and you, you get home and you feel guilty about that. But my 18 year old son, he's like, you know, Hey, I get it now. Like I get why you did this. I get it because you gave us the opportunities to do these things that we want to do. Yeah. All right. That's beautiful. I mean, I just, this is a weird thing, but I just watched something. I think it was Netflix at the, uh, the Manning family 
you know, Eli, Archie, uh, Peyton, and Cooper. He just wanted to be a dad. He didn't want to, he just wanted to be there because his dad, he walked in, his dad just committed suicide. So his job was just to be there for his kids, a dad, not an NFL right. dad, not an NFL coach, just a dad. Yep. Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, there's a lot of people who can balance that, but, you know, again, in any situation, especially when you're starting a business, I mean, you know, I, when I mentor and I teach, you know, people on a daily basis, I get phone calls, Hey, give me some advice for this, this, and this. And I'm like, everything you think that starting a business is going to be throw it out the window. If you think that you're going to take 20 vacations a year, throw that out the window. It doesn't matter how successful you are. You still aren't. There's no such thing as vacation. Your cell phone's going to ring. You're going to have an employee problem. You're going to have a client issue. Forget all that mess. I don't care what you've been taught or what you read in a book somewhere. You got to be prepared to put in the work. And it's going to be 12, 14, 20 hour days sometimes. And you're going to have to understand you're going to miss some of the things. You're going to miss some of the things with the kids, with the family. That's just what being an entrepreneur is about. Some people are cut out for that and some people aren't. Um, you know, it takes a special type of person to realize that they're going to miss out on a big portion of, of their most important, important asset, which is their children. Yeah. Um, but hopefully they're learning and growing through that experience that the, the kids are and the family is as well. Well, I think your kid, your 18 year old, he just had to decide, well, I see why you did it because it gave us these, uh, these other opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Shannon, I, I want to appreciate you uh just spending 45 minutes with me this is lovely and we're expected to see you on the ink uh 5000 or is it ink 500 or ink 5000 uh, i think it's 5000 now but we're hopefully we'll be, be underneath the 500 mark <laughs> well if, yeah if you go from zero to 25 million first year and then 25 to 50 uh you're going to be on there yeah no, hey how no. does that help you do you do you like the accolades and the recognition or does that help you get business well, you know, I don't honestly think that anybody's ever made a choice of our company because we're an Inc. 500, you know, recipient. Uh, you know, when it comes down to it, to me, it's it's about the product and the character and the integrity of the organization. But um, it does help on a marketing perspective. But the the Inc. events, and of course, I know pandemic wise, that probably hasn't happened. But I remember going to those Inc. 500 events in 2007, 2008, 2009. It is an amazing networking event. Oh yeah, um, and I think that. that's probably the best benefit. You know, you've got you know, 4,000 CEOs of companies that are showing up to get an award, but they're also there to learn and they're up there, they're, they're in a network. And, you know, we don't even go to trade shows anymore right. and set up a booth. We go to them, but we don't booth, we don't set up a booth anymore. Cause I think that's just lost a lot of luster. What we do is we go there and network with other partners, set up dinners, do those things. So to me, that was the real reward of Inc 500 as far as a business is concerned. Um, you know, it's great to have that plaque on the wall and it, and, and it does, from a recruiting perspective, I think it can help you from an employee base. Well, it definitely because they you understand your stable a, company and your growing company. Yeah, definitely getting noticed on the private equity because private equity sits there and looks at those companies and going, like, "Well, what about this company?" Oh yeah, for sure. We had we had we had a lot of calls. I mean, the first three or four weeks that magazine is released, you know, your phone's ringing off the hook as a CEO, and you know, hey, hey, are you interested in this, this, and this? You know, at the time we're like, you know, you know, we're we're good, we're growing, we're sustainable, we've got great cash flow, but. But it is a great, it's a great opportunity. It's a book a list for them to invest in. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you, of course, and one last question before you go is, uh, do you have a group of masterminds that you work with other coaches, mentors that run 100, $500 million businesses that you can go to? So I do, I've had a mentor when I was fairly young. Um, he is, he is retired now. You know, I will bounce some things off of him, but I'm part of a local group. It's called Vistage. Yeah, yeah, sure you heard of it. a, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a local CEO group here, um, and where our headquarters are. So you know, I do uh, have, and, and this is a fairly new thing to uh, for me to Birmingham. But um, you know, I we network on a monthly basis. You know, we're able to drop ideas, bring problems to the table, and I think it. I think it's important. I think every doesn't matter how successful you've been. I think every CEO should surround themselves with three three really good people. One is somebody, a mentor that you trust. Two is the strong CFO. Um, and when people ask me like what I spend most of my money on or what it was my best investment, it's a strong CFO. There's probably only one person in the organization that's ever been able to tell me no for 20 years and that's him. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, as, a, as an entrepreneur, I want to go, go, go. I want to run, run, run. I want to sprint. There's no such thing as walking. And to have someone you trust enough to be able to walk in your office and say, hold on, we're not writing this check today. We're not spending this money. We're not going to do this acquisition. Um, that's something that I need around me all, all the time. And I think the, the final thing is a supportive, you know, obviously family group. 
Um, yeah. You got to have people behind you that support you. So those are the three main keys to me. Lovely. Did the, did the CFO say yes on both of these acquisitions you're working on? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All so right. I, I got the buy-in there. Good deal. Hey, Shannon, thank you very much for spending time with the uh, top M&A entrepreneurs. Absolutely. Great to be here. Appreciate it, John. Take care. Cheers.